Hello, everybody. My name is Brian Parno, and this is joint work with my colleagues at Microsoft Research, along with two interns who joined us from the University of Virginia. So in our work, we consider a scenario where Alice is a scientist, and unfortunately, she hasn't been very lucky with her grants. And so she can't afford the cluster of her dreams, and instead, she's going to outsource her research to the cloud and get a response back from the cloud. Based on that response, she might send the computation and run it with some new data, hoping to get a new answer. Of course, from Alice's perspective, it's very important to know whether the cloud's doing what she asked it to, or if it's doing something a little bit simpler and probably cheaper from the cloud's perspective. Even from the perspective of a uh, non-malicious provider, we like to think that places like Azure and Amazon are not, in fact, malicious, it can be desirable to be able to prove that you did the correct computation, both to instill confidence in your customers and potentially to help shed liability. So if a customer is upset with the outputs he's getting from the cloud, it'd be nice to be able to prove that those outputs came from the inputs that he provided and not a mistake on the provider's part. So to formalize this setting, we define a notion of verifiable computation protocols. And what this means is that Alice can take the function that she wants to outsource and convert it into a pair of keys, a public evaluation key and a public verification key. She can then send the input that she wants to compute on to the cloud, and the worker can compute the correct answer and use the public evaluation key to produce a proof that this particular output is the correct answer for the input that was provided. This proof is publicly verifiable, so you can think of it like a digital signature, except that it covers the entire computation, not just a message. And so we can send this proof along with the output back to Alice, and she can use the public verification key to check that this is indeed the correct output. Of course, the key challenge here is that we want the verification to be cheaper than computing the function itself, or we haven't won a whole lot from outsourcing. Now, we can add a flavor of zero knowledge to this entire setup, and here it's better to think of the cloud as, say, another scientist. And this scientist has access to a private database, and he's willing to let Alice compute over it, but he doesn't want to give her direct access to that database. And so Alice can provide her input to Bob, and Bob can compute a function both of his input and Alice's input, and he can send back a proof that convinces Alice that the computation was done correctly, even though Alice le learns nothing about Bob's input. And so this has been a very exciting area to work in lately. When I first started working in this area in 2007, if you took a state-of-the-art protocol and used it to verify a computation, it could take upwards of 72 trillion years to verify a computation that would take about 15 milliseconds locally. Um, fortunately, we've seen tra dramatic improvements in the area, um, I've, I've, both for myself and from many others in the community, to the point where two years ago at this conference, we presented the Pinocchio protocol where we were finally able to break past the point where verification was cheaper than doing the computation yourself. And overall, this represented a fall in 23 orders of magnitude in the course cost of verifying these computations. Um, and since then, there's been a ton of great work in this area. Um, there's been work on optimizing the Pinocchio protocol for various operations, on adding to the expressivity of the protocol, as well as using it for various applications, including uh, Bitcoin. And you'll hear about a couple of these later in this, this session. However, if you look back at the worker and look at how much effort it takes to produce one of these proofs, there we've seen a fall of 18 orders of magnitude, which is great, and in many areas of computer science, you could just say, all right, we're done. Uh, but unfortunately, here we're still four to six orders of magnitude slower than the original computation. So you're doing a ton of work to produce this proof way above and beyond what you did to produce the answer. And so with Geppetto, we've tried to look at ways in which we can reduce the cost of generating the proof, as well as increasing the flexibility of the prover for various classes of computation. And so we've developed a new encoding we call multi-QAPs to enable computations over shared state. We've optimized the notion of bounded bootstrapping for proofs about proofs, and I'll talk a minute, in a minute about why that's useful. And finally, we've brought the cost of generating the proof closer to the cost of the actual runtime through something we call energy-saving circuits. And to support this new versatility, we've built a new compiler architecture that scales higher and enables more flexibility than previous compilers. So to give you a little bit of background before going into the details, the Pinocchio system took the C code that you wanted to outsource to the remote cloud and compiled it to an intermediate representation that looked like a circuit. That circuit was then compiled to an encoding we call a multi-QAP, sorry, that we call a quadratic arithmetic program, or QAP, and that encoding is designed to lend itself to very efficient cryptographic protocols, such as the key generation, proof generation, and verification algorithms I told you about earlier. And so the important thing for this talk is that the cost of generating the proof, as well as the key size, grows in proportion to this intermediate circuit representation. And so that's where we're going to focus our optimization efforts. 
So let's look at how Pinocchio would compile a stateful computation, such as a loop that's updating its state on every iteration. So the first thing we would do is compile the body of the loop to a circuit, but then we would repeat that body four more times as we unroll the loop. And so this is going to create a very large circuit representation and hence lead to a large evaluation key. And that's not going to be very performant. So how could we do better? Well, we could com compile just the body and compile that directly into an evaluation key. But then how do we produce a proof? Well, the worker can take the input that the client provided and feed it through the circuit to get some intermediate state. We can then take that intermediate state and feed it through a circuit again to get a new intermediate state. And of course, we can repeat this over and over and over again until we finally get the output that the client was expecting. But uh, that raises the question of how does the client check that we did this correctly? Well, we obviously have to send her the input and output, but to make sure that all of that state was correctly routed from one output to the next input, we're gonna have to send all of that back to her as well. And all of a sudden, she's not quite as efficient as she used to be. And we see a similar problem if you look at sort of map reduce style operations. So we have a whole lot of mappers that are gonna feed a set of reducers. And in theory, we could turn all of this into one giant evaluation key representing the entire computation, but that's gonna be extremely inefficient. Instead, we'd like to produce an evaluation key that just represents one map operation, and similarly one key that represents the reduce operation. But if you look at how the computation proceeds, we're gonna have a whole lot of input data. The mappers are gonna produce a whole lot of intermediate state before producing the final output. And we really don't wanna send all of that back to the client to check that the computations were done correctly. So with Geppetto, we address this in two ways. First, we generalize the encoding scheme that we're using to create what we call a multi-QAP, and we use that to generalize the cryptographic protocols to create a commit and prove scheme. So to give you a little bit more detail about what that means, we're still going to have the same key generation algorithm that we did before, but now the prover can commit to a series of inputs and create a constant size commitment representing a large set of data. They can then use that commitment along with other commitments to generate a proof that the values that those commitments correspond to are a correct evaluation of the function. And so essentially the prover can commit to different values and use those commitments in many different proofs and thereby save effort on computations that share state across insta instantiations. And similarly, the verifier can verify a commitment once, check that it's correct, and then verify many proofs that make use of that commitment. So to go back to our MapReduce example, instead of sending all this data back to the client, the client can specify all the inputs based on commitments that she pre-computes. Similarly, the worker, as he's producing this intermediate state, can produce commitments to those values, and that's all we're gonna send back to the client. So she's gonna get a small collection of commitments, and she'll get a set of proofs showing that those commitments were used properly in the computations. And why is this a win? Well, the, co the commitments are constant size regardless of the data. So only 256 bytes regardless of how big the data is, and the size of the proofs is constant regardless of how complex the uh, computation it is. And so Alice is only gonna receive a small set of data that's easy to, easy to handle. And so to look at the impact this has on performance, we can compare against a system from last year's SOSP called Pantry, where they were also trying to handle stateful MapReduce computations. However, they were doing it by doing hashing, verified hashing at the application layer, rather than changing the underlying cryptographic routines. And so you can see how long it takes to generate proofs for various benchmark applications. And the high order bit is that Geppetto's improving by one to three orders of magnitude on how long it takes to generate these proofs. Now, if we look back at how much work Alice has to do now, for each of these commitments that she receives, she needs to verify that the commitment is correct, and then for each of the proofs, she also has to verify that those are correct, given those commitments. Now, this isn't too much work, but it's still a little bit less attractive than the original Pinocchio protocol, where Alice only received a single constant size proof and did a constant amount of work on that proof. So how can we get back to that world? Well, if we look at all this code that she's gonna run to do the verification, we can think of that as one, one big C program, and we can run Geppetto on it again and generate a new evaluation key for that verification step, and we can outsource that operation as well. And then we can similarly turn all these commitments and proofs into a single commitment and proof to the larger set of data. And so now Alice is back into a world where she only looks at one commitment and one proof to check that the entire computation was done correctly. So essentially, if you look at our pipeline, what we've done is add a layer of recursion so that we can run this process over and over again. Unfortunately, if you do this naively, the time to take to verify a single commitment or proof can take upwards of five CPU days. And so that's not gonna be great from, a, uh, from, from the prover standpoint. So how can we do better? Well, in a paper last year at Crypto, uh, Ben Sasan et al. developed a very nice set of elliptic curve technology that allowed them to do unbounded recursion in this style. So they can do proofs about proofs about proofs, sort of ad infinitum. 
Um, and they also use this for a general CPU interpreter, so they can support a very general class of uh, computations. Unfortunately, this led to fairly slow performance. So if you look at sort of a standard benchmark uh, application, it can take upwards of 29 years to run on this framework. So with Geppetto, we explored a different option. We looked at different elliptic curves that give better performance, but require a fixed bound ahead of time. So you have to commit ahead of time to how many proofs about proofs you're going to do. And we also choose an approach based on compilation, so you have to specify the function that you want to verify, and we're going to compile keys specific to that function. In exchange, however, we get a uh, result that we're able to do these proofs about proofs much more efficiently. Overall, we've improved by up to five orders of magnitude for, for some of these computations. And finally, we looked at how we can do better for various programming constructs that show up regularly. How can we encode them in a more efficient manner? In particular, if you look at how a standard co uh, compiler like Pinocchio or a lot of the compilers in the secure multi-party computation literature work, if you have an if-else branch, you compile a circuit representing the if portion, you compile a circuit representing the else portion, and then you add a multiplexer at the end to decide which of the two sets of values are going to continue to the rest of the circuit. Unfortunately, if you look at how this is used in the cryptographic protocol, essentially we're going to do a giant multi-exponentiation where some of the values are coming from the if branch and some of the values are coming from the else branch. And so regardless of which branch we take, we're going to end up doing cryptographic work for both branches, and so that seems rather unattractive. What we realized was that if we instead move the multiplexer to the inputs, we can ensure that in the branch that's not taken, in this case the else branch, all the values are driven to zero. And so when we go to do the exponentiation in the cryptographic work, all of those go to zero, and so it's very easy to do those exponents. And so essentially now the co computational work for the prover to generate the proof is proportional to the branch that we actually take rather than all possible branches. If you look at the impact this has, if you look at the standard way of compiling, say we compile ahead of time expecting to do five, make five iterations of a loop, and in practice we only do one. Well, you're, with the standard approach, you're still gonna do uh, effort proportional to all five. Whereas with the energy saving approach, if we compile for five but we end up only doing one, we do work that's much closer to the computation we would have done if we'd known ahead of time that we were only going to do one iteration. And so to support all this flexibility that Geppetto now offers, we developed a new compiler infrastructure. So we designed it to be a, a streaming architecture, so we skip the intermediate state entirely and go directly to the multi-QIP representation and from there onto the crypto. This allows us to scale better and to make better use of the memory resources that are available on the platform. On the front end, we've developed an, a new front end based on Clang and LLVM for consuming C code, and that allows us to take advantage of a lot of the great optimization work that's being done in that community. On the cryptographic side, we use a single symbolic interpretation engine to run through the program, and when we're generating keys, we have a very precise range and semantics tracking for all the unknown values that occur during key generation, and that allows us to create the smallest, most efficient keys possible. Then when it comes time to, for proof, we use the same engine, but we instantiate the, uh, the values in the program with concrete values and use those to generate the commitments and proofs. And finally, from the perspective of the verifier, this integrates very nicely with your existing code. And so for, all you have to do is label the, the function that you want to outsource, and it behaves sort of like an RPC. Your program can execute until it reaches that point. The values are outsourced, they come back, the underlying machinery checks that all every, the computation was done correctly, and then passes those values back into your program, which can continue executing as normally. And so altogether, thanks to these improvements, Geppetto is able to scale up to programs 40 times larger than previous works such as Pinocchio was able to handle. And so as we add all of this complexity to the compiler, it becomes more and more important to look at certification. In other words, being able to prove that the cryptographic material that we're generating actually respects the semantics of the original program that we started with and that we haven't made a mistake during the compilation process. We've also started looking at various applications, such as X509 certificate validation, as well as electronic voting. So just to summarize, with Geppetto, we've been able to reduce the cost of shared state computations, such as MapReduce and loops, by up one to three orders of magnitude. We've been able to reduce the cost of bootstrap proofs by up to five orders of magnitude. And we're able to align prover costs with the actual ex runtime execution rather than worst case execution through these energy saving circuits. And all of this is supported by a new compiler infrastructure that increases the scale and flexibility of what we can support. So, thank you. Okay. So how, how much does it cost to generate the keys in the first place as compared to, like if Alice couldn't run the cures cancer predicate, 
could she generate the keys necessary to run the pure cancer predicate? Sure. So the, the cost to generate the keys generally scales proportionally to one execution of the program. Um, and so you do need to be able to have some computational oomph to get that, to get that started. Uh, though, interestingly, there's a talk later in this session on how you can distribute that work and have multiple people involved in the, the key generation. Optimizations be applied independently of each other? Like, can you take advantage of the energy saving circuits without needing to use bootstrapping or you know, other permutations? Yeah, indeed. All, all of these are sort of independent optimizations. They, they happen to play nicely with each other. So, when you're, when you're doing bootstrapping, you have several independent computations, like you're doing the same verification algorithm to many different proofs. So, that's nice. And also, with the fixed bounded bootstrapping, you have to commit in advance to how many proofs you want to verify. Mm -hmm. and so, having the energy saving is kind of nice if you wind up verifying fewer proofs. But yeah, each one can be applied sort of independently. Any other questions? <clears throat> so when are we going to get uh, an SOK paper explaining all of that? It seems like the space of optimizations is so complicated here now. And like Andrew was saying, some, you know, uh, it seems like most of them play well together. So when are we going to have the grand paper explaining sort of all the, the points? Someday when I find the right intern, I guess. <laughs> All right, uh, let's thank Brian.